And so this month we have endeavored to look at Genesis from the concept of the beginning. Obviously that being the definition of, of Genesis. And, and we've observed that it, of course, is the beginning of, of our life and this creation that we see. Genesis 1 and 2 talk to us about that. But then unfortunately, as Leon talked about as well, we see it's the beginning of sin. It's the beginning of death. And of course, our God, He had to have a solution for that. And He records that for us in Genesis 3 and verse 15, giving us that great escape. And seeing how so many took the way of Eve and they departed from the pathway that God had planned for them, God destroyed the earth by flood. And Leon touched on that last week. But it's the beginning of our faith. Faith of our fathers, that song that we just proclaimed, in many ways spoke to those who started the church. But if you think about the faith of the one who started it all, and started that relationship that God desired for His people to have with Him, that would be Father Abraham. And so, for the remainder of this month, tonight, and then both sermons Sunday, we're going to focus on Abraham being the father of our faith. And when we say Abraham is the father of our faith, it is only us in this building and those who would worship in the manner in which we do who can rightly claim him as our father. See, there are three major religions that claim Abraham as their father. But it is only those who truly walk by the faith that God has called to that can truly call Abraham the father of faith. The Muslims do not walk in a manner that is pleasing unto God. They don't walk in the pathway that was promised by God unto Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And the Jews, they still continue to look and long for something that has already come through the promised Savior of Christ Jesus and thus repeatedly in His message to the scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus has to remind them that Abraham is not your father. Though you can trace some sort of lineage back to Him, He's not your father. And so I want to introduce the, the concept this evening of, of Abraham being the father of our faith. Let's start in Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. And what we're going to see here is there, there's a shift in chapter 11. There's a, there's a great shift in chapter 11. After the Tower of Babel, we see that there is genealogy given. You can go back and you can read that genealogy. And for the high percentage part of that, only male children are listed, number one. But it's also generally only one child is mentioned. And then there's a turn and a shift as the genealogy is recorded for us. And it becomes much more specific in the recording. Read with me in verse 27 of chapter 11 in Genesis. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father, Terah, in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren. She had no child. You notice here that we start shifting in, in multiple children. Oftentimes what was recorded for us in the genealogy up until that point was, and there was other sons and daughters that this man had. But here at least three of, if not the only three children born, are listed. Because this particular family is important and this is where much attention is supposed to be given. God, through the Holy Spirit and the pen of Moses, is making sure that we take special notice of this particular family. Continuing here in verse 31, Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. When they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years. Terah died in Haran. 
And so we see here some, some journeying, and, and Acts chapter 7 is going to give us insight into the, the cause and the call for that journey from Ur to Canaan. And then we just have to question and wonder why was there a pit stop along the way? What, what prevented the, the migration on down into Canaan? But the whole family was called out of Mesopotamia. Well, that would be Ur of the Chaldeans. You know, what's also interesting here in verse 30 is, is we see a weakness pointed out in Abraham's wife. There, there really seems to be no place for that in this order of genealogy. But it's recorded for us here in verse 30. Now Sarai was barren. She had no child. You think about the book of Moses being a, a rather long writing. Most people would have not been able to just sit down and read this all in one undertaking. I would think it would be uh, to have some understanding to read all the way from here until we get into chapter 21. That would be a rather long reading. So let's just imagine if, if you're reading this and you put it down after chapter 12 and, and you go on about your business and you're going to come back to read. There seems to be a problem with verse 30 as it appeals to chapter 12 and verses 1 through 3, right? Because in chapter 12 and verses 1 through 3, it says this, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and from your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed, or as some translations read it, and through your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Now, how could that happen? And how can we speak to the offspring of Abraham if he's married to a woman who is barren? And so you see a conflict that is started here. You see a woman who is in many ways broken, if not could be rendered imperfect, but yet a promise is made. And what we find is really that Sarai cannot become who she's called to be or who she needs to be in this grand promise that is there without what? Without the help of God Almighty. Without the help of God Almighty, Sarah cannot be a part of these promises that are extended to us in chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. So what we see in Sarai, just by having an understanding of the lineage that is laid out for us, is she looks like us. Imperfect. Broken. With shortcomings and things that we need to overcome. And all that we need to be is possible. God has promised, right? He'll never leave us nor forsake us. All things work together for good for those who serve the Lord. So it is possible. But as Ephesians 6 tells us, it's not possible without God. For in Ephesians chapter 6, and starting there at about verse 10, it tells us without putting on the whole armor of God, we cannot stand against the schemes of the devil. So too Sarai would be unable to experience the promises of God as it were given to her and her family through Abraham in chapter 12 without the help of God. And so I, I believe as we look and expand upon the thoughts that are given to us and the promises given to us in chapter 12, we're going to see that through Abraham, we not only learn how our faith should act, how our faith should look, but I think through this character, Abraham, we see who God is. God not only tells us and shares with us the story of Abraham, but He shares with us the story of Him. And it's through this story of Abraham that he's trying to connect with us and call us to the faith that we are to have. Because I find it interesting. Let's go to Matthew chapter 1. Springboarding off of this promise that's given for us in chapter 12. Matthew chapter 1 would be yet another place where we find genealogy mentioned. And this particular genealogy is very important, especially to the, to the reader of Matthew. If you're sitting down, this is the introduction to your Savior. This is the introduction to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And to the Jew, this genealogy would have been important. And also to understanding the fulfillment that, that Christ Jesus is, it would be important to us. 
But let's notice where he starts. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now that's out of place. That's not chronologically correct. The son of David and the son of Abraham. There's a message again in just those two names. The son of David would signify that the king is here. And the king has arrived. And therefore the call back to David, King David. But the son of Abraham would signify that this is also the son of promise. The one that we've all been longing for and all been looking for since the promise given in chapter 12. Let's continue in the Gospel of Matthew and just make some observations of the importance of Father Abraham. Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22 and we'll be here in verse, in verse 30. And we want, to, we want to see how Jesus relates to the audience concerning His Father. Verse 30 of Matthew 22. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. What he's referring to them, or, or, or making sure they understand, is that the God that he's speaking of and he's referring to as he answers the question they put before them is the God of Abraham. That Abraham whom they would call what? Their father. Whom we know he had explained to them that he's, he's really not your father because you're not walking by faith. And he concludes that thought with this idea. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Now, he is quoting from what was said to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. And so, in preparation for tonight's discussion, I just find it interesting that Jehovah God, Creator and Sustainer of all the earth, would introduce Himself by referencing a created being. That's rare. It happens at times, but it's rare for someone to make a reference to a lesser as they introduce themselves to you. Generally, you would make a reference to someone above you as to what? Lift yourself up, right? But he says, I am the God of Abraham. Why is the Creator of heaven and earth introducing Himself to a people as the God of Abraham? There's probably a couple of answers for that, but I want us to meditate on that as, as we digest the rest of the New Testament passages that, that we want to look at tonight that reference Abraham. But why did God introduce Himself to a people in this manner? Let's go to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. This is after Mary has been told what is going to happen to her, that she shall conceive a child though a virgin she shall conceive a child and she is overcome with joy and she understands that what would go on in her life would be a fulfillment of the grand promises that God has had for his people for generations and so in Luke chapter 1 Verse 52, Mary, speaking thus of God, says, He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich He has sent away empty. He has helped His servant Israel in remembrance of His mercy as He spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to His offspring forever. And, and so I, I would say that through the life of Abraham, we are introduced to not only who Abraham is and this action of faith that we should mimic in our lives, but we're, we're to learn more about God through the life of Abraham as well. And so as we ponder this idea of why would God introduce Himself to a people by referencing a mere mortal and referencing Abraham? Well, I think Mary here tells us in chapter 1 that it's because it proves that God is a God of promise. 
God is a promise keeper. Why reference Abraham? Because if you understand the life of Abraham, what you understand is God is saying, I am the God of Abraham. Meaning, as I kept my promises to Abraham, so shall I keep them unto you. And Mary that evening was humbled that she would be selected for yes, such a grand task that was before her to carry within her the Son of God but also humbled in the fact of knowing that the promises that God set forth really in the foundation of the world, but especially and specifically for tonight in Genesis chapter 12, they are being fulfilled. And just as God kept His promise to that barren woman introduced to us in Genesis chapter 11, just as He kept His promises to that woman, so too shall He keep His promises to us today. And so in introducing Himself as the God of Abraham, He introduces Himself to us as a God who keeps His promises. And brethren, in the day and age which we live in, and every social media account has a lie on every other post and every politician telling us different things and promises being broken left and right and sometimes by family members. We need a God of promise. Amen. And we need to cling to that with the same humility and intensity that Mary clung to that promise keeper that night and allow it to be the wind beneath our wings as we migrate through this journey of life, knowing that we are humbly submitting to a God of promise who has always kept His promises. And that's why He introduced Himself to us in this manner. Let's go back. We'll be in the New Testament real quickly, but I want to refocus a, a bit in Genesis chapter 12. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. There have been hints thus far in the narrative of Genesis of, of who God is and this promise, right? The grand promise that was first revealed to us in chapter 3 and verse 15. And He's been pointing to this promise all along the way. But He affirms it to us and makes it more clear in chapter 12 that He has a plan. And He has a plan not just for a small few but He has a plan for all mankind. He makes it clear for us in Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you... All the families of the earth shall be blessed. Leaving out no one. As sin entered the world through one man, thus the answer for sin came to us through one man, that being Christ Jesus. So we were all cursed because of that sin. It was inevitable that we would all fall. But here He says that through your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. We won't have time to elaborate on this tonight, but we will next Sunday. But if you think about this, the Jews should have understood that this promise of blessings was given to an uncircumcised man. It was given to a man living outside of the law. It was given to a man that was before the law. And so therefore, the promises of blessings and residing in the blessings are for all nations. Not exclusive to Israel. Not exclusive to the Jew. But open here, as God says in His promise, to all nations. And it's only through Christ Jesus that that can be accomplished. But still, the actions and the faith that Abraham put into action is the same faith that we're called upon to have. Let's turn our Bibles to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 3, and we're going to be in verse 7. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 7. Know then that it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham. Paul here just repeating to the Holy Spirit what Jesus had had to teach in his ministry. That it's not the flesh that makes you a son of Abraham. It is your faith that makes you a son of Abraham. And the Scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith 
preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. How should we interpret Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3? We should interpret it to mean that through him all nations of the earth should be blessed, even or especially the Gentiles should be blessed. Well, what was he trying to establish in Genesis chapter 12? Was he, was he predominantly trying to establish a nation? Or was he trying to establish salvation for all mankind? And he, his attempt and his aim was to establish salvation for all mankind. The Apostle Paul, through inspiration, relates that to us here in Galatians chapter 3. That we are to understand that he had us in mind when he made that promise to Abraham. And it is ours to seize, but only by faith. Not by works of the law, or a simple understanding of knowing that promise was made to a man not living in the law would help us better understand that. Let's continue here in, in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 18. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by a promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. He's proving to us through this relationship that he has with Abraham that he's a promise keeper. But he's also showing to us that he's a merciful God. We're going to highlight the faith of Abraham, but did Abraham fail? Did Abraham have shortcomings in his life? Yes. But the mercy of God was extended unto him that he didn't have to pay the ultimate price for those shortcomings and those sins that were in his life. Was there grace? Offered and extended to Abraham through these promises? Yes. I will give you a land that you don't have to conquer. I will give a land unto you that you don't have to fight for. A land that you don't have to fortify. I will give it to you. I will give you a nation. If you think about that nation that he finally received, on man's part, there was so much done to see that it may never come to fruition. Had it been upon man and man alone, that nation would have never existed. But by grace, that nation existed and was granted because why? God is gracious and He's a promise keeper. And He teaches us that through the promise that He granted unto Abraham. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 12. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 12. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 12, yet again... <clears throat> We see here, we'll read verse 3 yet again, and it says, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And again, we talked about earlier the difficulty of this, considering what verse 30 says, that Sarai was barren. I mean, that throws up a, a, a bit of an issue, right, in the keeping of this promise. Let's turn forward a bit in Genesis to Genesis chapter 21. Genesis chapter 21 Again, Sarai was barren, unable to have children for whatever reason that was, but she was unable. The time had certainly passed. That's what Hebrews chapter 11 tells us. The time had passed, and it had. She was 90. <clears throat> what was chapter 21 in verse 1 say? The Lord visited Sarah as He had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as He had. And Mary understood those words that night that she exclaimed that this is the God of Abraham. He kept His promise to Abraham that He would indeed bring about a son, a promised and chosen one, and He did. Was there doubt along the way that this moment would ever happen? Was there doubt on Sarah's part? Even up until the point that it was promised, she laughed. Did Abraham ever doubt? Oh, he doubted. Does that teach us about ourselves, though? That we're going to doubt if we can ever get there and achieve the promises that are there? But though we have doubts, what is always there? 
the promises are there. The Lord will do as He has promised in spite of our shortcomings and in spite of our doubts and our fears, the Lord is able to deliver. And He proved that to Abraham and Sarah time and time again. And as we reflect back on the life of Abraham and Sarah, again, do we reflect back on them as perfect and having earned the grace and the mercy of God and having earned the right to receive the promises? Oh no. But we see a people who were willing to rectify the wrongs in their lives and willing to always seek back unto God. Though they had doubts, they didn't take those doubts anywhere else except for where? To God. And in the end, through God's patient mercy, we have His promise kept unto Sarai here in chapter 21. And now our final point of the night is in, again, as we think about Genesis 12, let's go back there. Genesis chapter 12. I want us to see how our lives mirror that of Abraham. Thanks be to God, He's the same. But our thoughts sometimes waver. Here's what I mean by that. Genesis 12 and verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Now what we understand is at the time that, that he's told this, where is he? Well, he's in, he's in Haran. Where was he when he was first told to go? He was an Ur of the Chaldees. Stephen would give us insight into that in Acts chapter 7. So why'd they stop? Could have been because of doubt. Could have been because I, I don't know exactly where Canaan is. For whatever reason, they stopped. And now what does the Lord say? I will strike you down because you stopped and you will die and be buried here. No. Leave your father's house. Now, was that a comfortable ask that God had for Abraham? It's difficult to build a house this day and age. Many in the room have done it. Some are currently doing it, right? It's hard. But it's not as hard as it was then. And Abraham's father had established a home place. Maybe not brick and mortar. Maybe not the same manner that we have, but there had been work put into the dwelling place that Abraham was at. It was his father's house. It was this area, estate, if you will, that he was dwelling at. And I would presume he was rather comfortable in that place. What God say to him? This is not where I want you to be. I need you to leave where you are and go to the place that I have promised you. And in the simplest way, that is how we mirror and mimic the faith of Abraham. Because he is calling on us this night to go. Get out of here. And I'm not talking about Hansel Alabama. I'm saying get out of this world. That's the call that he makes to us through the gospel of Jesus Christ is to get out of here. Go! Leave this place that you're comfortable with. And I, I'm obviously not calling for us to die this evening. What I'm telling you is die with Christ. And proclaim as Paul proclaimed, it is no longer I who live it, but Christ who lives in me. And that's the call that we've been called to. It's to no longer see this world and where we're presently seated as preeminent. And no longer make this our comfortable dwelling place, but go and get uncomfortable now. That is the call that God had for Abraham. And now Paul exclaims to us, you will be pleasing unto God if what? If you have the faith of Abraham. And so the invitation tonight is, go. Let's go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. Understanding all that Jesus had said to us while He was walking and talking on this earth. If a man does not take up his cross and follow after Me, he is not worthy. If a man does, loves father and mother more than Me, he is not worthy. And therefore God said to Abraham, go. 
Leave the house of your father. Put that behind and go to the place that I have planned for you. Go to the promised land. Hebrews 11 and verse 8. By faith Abraham obeyed. When he was called to go to a place that he was to receive his inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. He knew everything about that place he had been. He probably knew his hometown like the back of his hand. Yet he's been called to go to a place unknown and foreign to him. What's the weather going to be like? I don't know. But God said go. Now, if you think about the journey and all that you know about Abraham, was, was it a straight shot and everything was easy and when he got there? No. But it was the place God had promised him to be. And I'm going to tell you, brother, when we start our journey, when we start walking in faith, unfortunately, there is so much that is unknown. And so much that we just don't know how it's going to work out. But he knows. He knows. And for Abraham, simply put, that was enough for him. It was enough to know that the Lord knows where I'm going. And therefore, Hebrews records for us, he went. Continuing here in verse 9, By faith he went to, to live in the land of promise, in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. That's how we mimic the life of Abraham, is we go and we quit worrying about what's all around us. And we quit worrying about what we left behind. But we rest in what He has promised us to have. And so the question is tonight, are you going to walk by faith? Or are you going to walk by sight? Do you want to continue to live where you've always lived and be comfortable there? Or do you want to step out of the aisle in faith and go where He's promised you He will receive you? Whatever you need to do tonight to be right with God, I pray that you'll do so as together we stand and as we sing.